What's going on you guys? Today we're with an old family friend, Steve Beck, and we're gonna be checking out his whole shop. It's called Checkpoint Automotive, and he's got a lot of crazy cars here, but first of all, this is like a crazy structure. Do you wanna give a little bit of backstory? It's called a Quonset hut, it's, right? It's a Quonset hut. Uh, thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah. appreciate it, this is a lot of fun. And basically, this building is left over from a nursery that was here. This whole property, both sides of this place were plants and flowers, and this was mm -hmm. one of their buildings. And it's unusual, it's an elephant hut. The ribs are huge, and, and the story I heard was they used to store ammunition mm -hmm. in the elephant huts. So it's war surplus, it's been here since the 50s, and it's all rusty, but it's a cool place to park your car. Yeah, yeah. the lighting's awesome. But then they become like popular during like World War II or something like that? You could or? buy them in surplus, yeah. and people were putting them in their backyards, and yeah. you know, all you'd have to do is pour a slab and bolt them down. But like you said, it's perfect for parking cars. When the next big earthquake happens, this is where I want to be. <laughs> It'll never fall, it may roll down the street, but it's not gonna cave in. You know? Yeah. So when I first came in here, my eyes just went straight to these cars, but I don't know, what's the whole story? Are you, checks out the Cobras. Are you super rich or are you caretaking for some I people? I am a caretaker, <laughs> I am not rich, I am a poor mechanic. But you, what we have here are two different versions of the small block Cobra. We have one of the first ones that's covered in dust. It's number six and it's still owned by its original owner. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 260, which the first 70 cars were 260s and that's it. So it's pretty rare and it's never had the engine changed. The one next to it, is mid-year 64. It's the best of the 289 Cobras. It's what they call a Mark II. It's got the 289, it's got bigger brakes and bigger wheels and tires and all American wiring. And this is much more fun than this one to drive because they had all the kinks wor worked out of them in yeah. the early cars. But they don't just completely sit here, right? You take them out they once They get exercise. Long. Yeah, so that's yeah. good. But it, it's a huge responsibility. These cars are worth a lot of money. <laughs> if I crashed one, I'd feel real bad, although we have huge insurance here, but still. They're pieces of history. No, I would be terrified to drive this out there. Like there's so many crazy drivers and stuff, but. <laughs> they're so cool to drive that yeah. you forget what you're in. Because they're <laughs> light and they're quick and they, they steer like a little sports car and have muscle car horsepower. How many speeding tickets have you had <laughs> over oh, your life? Well, you know, a lot. Uh, in fact, I just paid for one the other day and got in the Mustang, but I've, I've had over 20. Wow. And, and I've lost my license twice. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, I'm a road offender for sure. Yeah. <laughs> So I just wanted to quickly interrupt the video and let you guys know that I partnered with Rec Watches. Super cool company. Their whole thing is recycling metal from either old cars or even motorcycles. But specifically this watch that they sent out is the P51 Green Hornet and this thing is so cool. So the metal dial in the watch is actually from one of Carroll Shelby's experimental prototype cars, specifically from his 1968 EXP 500 Mustang called the Green Hornet. And it's a super fascinating story surrounding the car. It has made a bunch of automotive buzz over the years and it's actually been recently restored. And so when they were restoring the car, they cut out some metal from the cowl and incorporated it into their watches. But the attention to detail surrounding this watch is insane. If you look at it, you can clearly see the influence from the gauges of the car. If you look at the side of the watch, you can see the grill. And if you look at the crown, it represents the wheel of the car. If you look at the watch band, you can see influence from the leather seats. There's so many cool things about this watch. The more I look at it, the more details I see. I've just realized that the people responsible for designing this are car people, and that's what's most important for me. I also like how it's a 42 millimeter diameter. It's not too big, it's not too small. It fits perfect on my wrist. And it's also an automatic, which I've never had a watch like this, but all you have to do is keep moving to keep it alive. So I'm stoked to add this to my collection. Huge shout out to Rec Watches. And they were also super kind enough to give you guys a 20% discount code that I'll leave down below. But with that being said, let's get back to the rest of the video. It just never ends here, you just keep walking and walking. <laughs> then the hot rod thing happened. And, and I admit, I, I was pretty late to the party with hot rods. And this is not the first one, but it, it's a good representation of what a hot four-cylinder hot rod would have been pre-war. 
because they didn't really, a lot of the guys didn't do V8s yet. There wasn't as much speed equipment. So mm -hmm. this is very typical. The paint is really cool. This thing's all swap meet parts. Yeah. I'm a believer in keeping the survivors together and building cars out of the parts that are available. And, and, and where we are, there's swap meets and estate sales and people trading parts all the time. And uh, that's what this is. It's a $50 frame and a, a body I traded for another one and an, an engine that used to be a doorstop at uh, Elko Welding down the street. <laughs> he tripped over and said, come get this thing out of here. And so I bought it and fixed it up and assembled this car. Good thing you're a mechanic. <laughs> yeah, it helps. It helps. <laughs> and then what's the story on this guy? Holy Grail car and hot rodding, 32 Ford. Never thought I'd ever have one. Everything on a 32 Ford is twice as expensive as a Model A or a Model T. And the big guys in hot rodding have 32 Fords. It's mm -hmm. the, the quintessential hot rod. Long story short, I traded a cylinder head for a pair of frame rails from Dick Wade in this town is Mr. 32. Everybody in the neighborhood started hearing that I had 32 rails. And all of a sudden there was a cross member and there was a pedal set and all these guys just started bringing me parts. About a year later, I got the body. It's a Brookville body, but it's as far as the reproductions go, it's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't pay 20 grand for a body. It just didn't make sense to me. Anyway, a couple of years later, it grew, it grew four more cylinders. It's a V8 now, and it's a better hot rod for it. It's uh, actually really clean. Everything's like, yeah, it's, it it's really nice. It's kind of the working mock-up. I'd love to take it apart and paint it and make it you know, all shiny and pretty like the big guys, but everybody's telling me, no, leave it alone. It's fine that way. So, no, I like it. It's really nice. It, uh, it's a good driver. It's got overdrive. It's still got a three-speed in it, but it's got a... A British overdrive in the torque tube, so you just flip uh -huh. the switch when you're on the freeway, and it just blows down the freeway at low RPM. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know where to move next. There's too many cars. <laughs> so now we're in your engine room. There's a bunch of stuff all over this the place. This is a cool room. Uh, yeah, I love wall hangers. Anybody who does antique or hot rods has a room like this or a garage like this where they yeah. pluck the parts off the wall they bought at the swap meet. <laughs> and uh, this car is representative of that. It is truly a swap meet car. Uh, first hot rod I ever built. Things were going like in the late 80s and early 90s. Your father and a whole bunch of other guys were starting car clubs and mm -hmm. I'd ride out there in my Mustang and see all these guys in their hot rods or my Model A and see these things. I'm going, I think I could build one of those, you know? And, and, uh, <laughs> All of a sudden, I was among them, and this thing was going together, and they, they welcomed me with open arms. It was a good, good group of people. These cars are, always evolve, you know, and, and they're built to a kind of a chronological time that you, you like. Mm -hmm. This is kind of just after the war. Okay. Although it has wire wheels and, and, and hood eye shocks, which is usually pre-war, but for me, that's the aesthetic that works for me. And they're not as good of cars as the later ones, but they have a soul and a character, and they're built out of parts that were there. You know, yeah. Before this car was put together. But it's, it's awesome being in here. Like I just can imagine if you had all like my Mustang parts up, like hanging. You're like, oh, I need that. Right. I need it's, that. <laughs> you know, you, it, it's the same thing. You know, it's just different generations. You're also a big Mustang guy too, though. I'm a serious Mustang guy. I've, <laughs> I've had one Mustang for 47 years. Yeah. Well, let's go. Let's go look at it. So this thing's awesome. It's kind of funny because this is the first Shelby Mustang on my channel, which you'd think I would have shot one already, but. It happened automatically. I didn't pursue a Shelby Mustang. Nobody cared back then. It was 1974. I had just graduated high school. I had turned 18 and I was looking for a car that would get me to work. I had two old cars that were unreliable and a friend of my brother said that he had a Mustang, one of those Shelby things that he wanted to sell and copped in my mom's car. We went down there and checked it out. and. Uh, it was green and all jacked up in the back and in terrible shape and I fell in love with it and bought it. How much? Uh, 900 bucks. <laughs> yeah. I hate hearing that. That's it's hilarious now. I don't even know. But you were saying it's pretty much stock to what it was, but you put in a new engine and you know, a little bit with the suspension, right? Or yeah, the, the spring rates are a little higher. The ride height, all the stuff, the, the tire size, all that stock. The engine's a little healthier, yeah. Uh, the original engine was gone at the time and, and uh, so I built an engine and I blew that up and I built another engine and blew that up. This is the fourth one. Yeah. And, uh, but I've collected all the correct parts to recreate, minus the serial number, but to recreate the 306 engine. Yeah, but you don't baby this thing at all. You, you it's, drive it's it. It's meant to be driven, you know, and, and 
there are fewer and fewer people like me in this hobby as they become more valuable. Mm -hmm. They're more of a collector deal, and the guys don't run them that hard. Yeah, but, but you race it too, right? You take it out to Willow Springs. It goes to, it does track so. days a, a, twice a year. As a kid, I, I slalomed the thing. I did a little bit of vintage auto racing with it. I street raced the heck out of the thing. I was very active in the car. I got into trouble with the law. The, the local <laughs> motor cop in Santa Monica would just go to my mom's house and wait for me to show up and write me in the driveway because he'd hear me in Santa Monica. You know, was, I mean, I, I think a lot of people would be in your, your same position with this. <laughs> 18 or whatever. An 18 year old have a, a rowdy car, but <laughs> yeah, was, at, at the time, it was so much fun and, and it, it was a life changer. I, I got hired in my first really big mechanic job for BMW because my other car was broken and I drove this. The boss walked around it and he said, if it's real, you're hired. And I opened the hood, he says, when can you start? I got to meet Shelby and know him as a friend and, and a lot of the, his associated people. And Pete Brock, John Morton, Bob Bondurant, I knew them all because I owned this car. Uh, you know. And in this area too, right? Yeah, this, uh, Shelby's just a few blocks away. So yeah, I mean, well, that's awesome. Fly, uh, I would love to go on a little drive with this thing. Yeah, let's go for a putt. Guess I'm ready. <laughs> the side pipes sound really good. Yeah, they give it a, a great sound. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this thing's awesome. How's your hearing? Oh, it's bad. <laughs> I mean, there, there's some levels that are just gone. It's yeah. definitely taken my hearing, hearing down. That's what I'm afraid of. You're uh, waking everyone up. <laughs> Wake up! It's Saturday afternoon. Are you breaking loose every time you're doing that? Yeah, it feels like it. <laughs> Not much traction. <laughs> Zero. Uh, this is one of those cars that just puts a smile on my face. time we go to the, do our open track, you need to come. Yeah, I know, I'd love to go. <laughs> yeah, this thing's awesome. Good thing you never sold it. I came close a few times. So we just got back. This guy drives his car crazy. That's what it's for. <laughs> but we had a really, really fun time. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming and doing this and uh, looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, I've been meaning to come out here and uh, it's exactly what I expected. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of guys in the LA Shelby Club that would love to do this as well that have equally amazing cars. And oh, I'm sure, so yeah. We'll definitely uh, get together on that. All right, all right. Yeah. Thank you.
Miss Lindy, she's a gal with the bright red hair. Now she stands high from.